Phoenix does. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, Jesse, to introduce our guest today. Thanks so much, Lisa. Happy Recovery Month to everybody that's listening, watching live. We'll listen to it. I have my Recovery Happens bracelet on, and I'm full recovery mode celebrating all sorts of different events and people and organizations this month. Uh, really excited for this episode. Today we have Katie Heinrich and Sydney Duran from the Phoenix. Uh, we're going to talk about their valuable insights and personal experiences regarding health and well-being and making that a huge piece of recovery. So good morning, and I will ask whoever would like to go first just to talk about how you got involved in this, what your your passion is behind this. What is the Phoenix for people that don't know? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm happy to hop in, Katie, if that's, if that's good. My name um, is Sydney, and uh, yeah, I, I've been with the Phoenix for a little over almost nine years now, which is wild to think about. Um, awesome. I tell folks I feel like I got on the rocket ship right before I was about to take off, um, and we were able to do some really exciting things. So I feel really grateful every day to get to be part of this work and this movement. Um, over, like, just a broad overview. The Phoenix, uh, we're a national nonprofit and our core mission is to bring people together in meaningful activities in a way that is healing. It helps people connect with one another and really build the resilience so people can not just stay in recovery and, and find peers, but really truly thrive and build a life that's bigger and better than they could have ever imagined. Um, and it's all free. And so the, the main way we do that is we offer free sober activities at a lot of what we do is fitness. We also do uh, music, social events, really trying to widen the door so folks can step into uh, meaningful activities in a peer group that's really focused on um, building, a, building, building a life and, and doing things that are rebuilding your self-esteem, building kind of things that uh, you maybe didn't imagine you were doing and didn't have a, a model of, of what that could look like in recovery. So um, that's, that's, what, that's what we do. We're currently in a little over 40 states. Um, and growing, a lot of our work is uh, fueled by volunteers. So we've really evolved our model over the last several years to empower local leaders and communities across the country. So we really believe if anyone raises their hand, regardless of if you're directly identify as a person in recovery, experience substance use, you're a family member, you're a loved one, um, if whoever and however you're connected to this work, if folks want to raise their hand and help lead new events or make events accessible for people uh, by our digital or in-person programs, we'll find a seat and uh, and a place because we need everyone to kind of grow this movement. So um, that's a broad overview and I'll let Katie kind of dive in if you want to share, um, introduce herself a little bit more too. Sure. That was an awesome overview, Sydney. Um, I've been with the Phoenix a lot shorter than Sydney. I joined in January of 2022 moved over actually from academia into a research position with the Phoenix. And so before I was doing a lot of research um, on kind of exercise programs, a lot on high intensity exercise training, where we worked with a lot of different groups, including the military and older adults. And um, I really started to notice the powerful effects of not just the exercise program, but doing it in a community and being a part of that. And so that was one of the things that really attracted me to this job with the Phoenix is that it's all about the community and bringing people together, whether it is through exercise programs or through all kinds of other activities. If you have an interest in, I don't know, anything, different kinds of arts or pickleball or yoga or book clubs. Um, I've done a tie-dye party with the Phoenix. Like there's all kinds of activities where maybe fitness isn't quite your thing. So there might be another doorway in to what we're doing, but then maybe you do decide, hey, I want to try maybe a wellness activity as well. So there's a lot of different options that we offer and, you know, 48 hours of sobriety is your ticket in and we welcome everybody and we have an app, which is great. So when um, Sydney talks us about us being in 40 states, you know, those are our physical programs, but we also have all kinds of things happening online, offered both from the Phoenix as well as through a bunch of partner organizations, which has really helped us expand our reach even just over the past, I don't know, six months or so. 
That's so fantastic. And so um, one of the things that I was just working on curriculum at Spectrum, right? We don't just do like our group curriculum, which brings people together just by nature of being a group on, you know, let's talk about, you know, relapse prevention and recovery skills. And, you know, we, we really expand that that reach to include a lot of wellness. And I love the description of all the kinds of things that Phoenix does because it really does match a lot of the domains, right, of wellness. So if you look at SAMHSA's eight um, domains of wellness like that, like it really does touch all of them, right? So, you know, that's, um, you know, emotional, spiritual, intellectual, physical, right? Which sometimes we miss. And I think is just a great opportunity. Um, environmental, so who you were around and what you were doing. Um, you know, financial, it's free. So that's super helpful. You can do it without having to stretch yourself. You know, occupational, you all have found, you know, occupations doing this work. And that social piece, right? And that is probably one of the biggest pieces. Can you just talk a little bit about what this does for social connection for individuals in recovery? Yeah, for sure. That's one of the things that is a key part. We have a logic model that kind of frames what we do and it shows how the meaningful activities we engage people in leads to connection with it, which then leads to other longer outcomes. And so social connection is one of the things that we measure and we see significant improvements over time in people reporting how connected they feel to other people. Um, and that's among everybody. So it's not just the people that are in recovery, but it's also people who are allies and supporters that do stuff with us. Uh, one of the interesting things in our data is that people who are new to recovery come in with significantly lower levels of connectedness to other people, but they significantly increase over time um, so that they're pretty much where people who are longer in recovery and not in recovery after even just three months with the Phoenix, which is pretty exciting. Um, we also, we're partnering with um, Dr. Meg Patterson, she's at Texas A&M, and she's currently doing a study where we're looking at the social networks between people who um, are part of the Phoenix. And we're, we're seeing some really neat outcomes with those where people, who um, are more connected um, are helping, they're reaching out and kind of bridging between other people. So I'm not explaining this well, let's see. So people who are longer in recovery um, are kind of like bridging connections between people within the Phoenix community that might be more kind of on the periphery. So they're not as well connected in the community. So they're actually like bridging, reaching out, connecting people together. And it's been really beautiful to see. Awesome. Awesome, Katie. I, I love a good research study. Uh, like Lisa said at the beginning before we kicked off, I, I do have lived experience with recovery. I uh, just celebrated 15 years in recovery last month. Um, Thank you. I, I also am a master's level clinician here at Spectrum Health Systems. So I, I see things sort of from both sides. And I can tell you the Phoenix is alive and well in central Massachusetts. As you were describing this, I know people who are, are involved and you talk about, you know, bridging that gap between people who are maybe, you know, in recovery one year, two year, three year, five year, 10 year, and, and somebody just coming in where, you know, 48 hours of recovery a month, two months, three months. Um, I, I wonder if it, either one of you can just share any, any uh, stories or any um, things that kind of stand out about those connections, like yeah, are there any ones that come to mind of, you know, this person came in two days sober, a month in recovery, and then they got a job and, and you know, whatever worked for Phoenix or, you know, did a group. You talked about all the different groups doesn't necessarily have to be fitness. I, I'm just wondering to give our uh, listeners like a, like a picture. I mean, I know what the Phoenix means to me and, and to those that, you know, are around Massachusetts, but um, anything that comes to mind that, you know, stands out from, from the members and the stories that I know you've heard over the, the years. Um, I'm happy to share a few. I, f I feel really lucky because I'm, I'm based in our, our Boston space and I get where we have a lot of different programs all the time. Um, so if, if we're on Zoom, I could, could 
put put my camera over there and you could see that there's stuff happening downstairs right now which is exciting awesome. but but because of the proximity we get to kind of see the um the little moments and the and like our phoenix moments all the time um i think i mean there's a few different i guess i'll one of them is we have um because volunteerism is is a big part in giving back in as you all know in the recovery community and and it's a big thing that fuels phoenix too and there's actually katie can speak to this too like a lot of evidence to support how that bolster further bolsters your recovery um but we have a member who um, learned about us through a partner organization. Um, I believe it was NECAT, um, which is a great organization, workforce development, supports a lot of folks um, coming out of the criminal legal system and, and it, um, impacted by addiction. And um, they got connected to Phoenix, started coming in to some, like helping out at some of our events because they um, have culinary experience. We're kind of helping at some of our um, events. And um, as now as a volunteer is going to support some of our, and so is is in Phoenix programming all the time. But now as a volunteer is actually supporting some of the work um, we're doing in the jails and the prisons, actually doing Phoenix programming behind the wall. Um, and so that's a really exciting kind of journey where someone, I think, one of the core ethos pieces at Phoenix is we believe everyone has intrinsic strength and gifts, and so I think we really see every single person, no matter what brought you there today, as like you, that's actually a strength that we're gonna, that you can leverage to go help the next person, um, regardless of of your background and what your kind of past experience is. So, so that I think to me is a really good example of like using that, uh, that lived experience and the empowerment and the skills kind of you're pulling along the way to be, um, to lead and do, do other things. I think um, this is more broad, but, our uh, founder some sometimes used to say like, yes, we have really am amazing outcomes and 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 um, research and folks like Katie who are really helping like hold the data together. Um, sometimes some of our best outcomes are seen on like Facebook or social media because also because you know people might come into Phoenix, they might meet other people here. Um, and then we're like seeing a post and it's not a Phoenix event, but people went like climbing or they went running with friends that they met here. Um, and so that to me is also, I think, a really great anecdote to show like folks are doing, you know, Phoenix or doing, you know, stuff that's supporting their recovery. It's just not like it's not even an event that we're hosting anymore. And that to me shows kind of the spread because they're just meeting friends and and folks who are going to help them along the way here. So, yeah. And those things become part of their recovery plan. Right. So yeah, they, they formally maybe joined some classes, made some connections, but those activities, the idea that that you can do these kinds of activities, like just kind of becomes part of who they are in in recovery. One of the things that yeah, that you um, talked a little bit about, so I'd love to hear more about is we just recently had in July um, our episode on um, our correctional treatment. We had our um our medical um, chief medical officer for our correctional treatment. And it's a big shift to add medications for opioid use disorder in correctional settings, right? We're in the Massachusetts state prison, we're in several county jails. And I love the concept of adding all of these other pieces of a solid recovery plan for someone while someone's incarcerated. Can you tell me a little bit more about what, what does that look like in a correctional yeah. environment? Um, yeah, so it looks like a few different ways. Um, and shout out to the Middlesex County Sheriff's Office because they were really leaders in um with and lead partners with the Phoenix within the last five years, um, who really wanted to think about how are we um creating really sustainable supportive pathways for folks when they're returning to the community. Um, and so they we actually have a small satellite site that's in Lowell, Massachusetts. It's with um where Phoenix has a little gym. That's within a community correction center, which is also a space where folks um, get other services. They can meet with clinicians, social workers, some of their um, folks they're working with are on reentry. And so we're also housed there. But um, so that was kind of started back in 2017. Um, we now have similar type. It, it varies, obviously, by state, depending on the systems and how it's set up and like partnerships. But um, what it looks like today is um, Phoenix actually physically has some trained volunteers and contractors or staff who can go um, behind certain correctional facilities and within 
uh, the facilities and lead Phoenix events. So it could be a fitness thing. It could be a all pathways meeting. It kind of depends on the um, interests and the kind of what the partnership ends up being. But it's that idea that if we can engage folks before they're coming back to the community and also plug people into like, hey, this is like, this community is here. Um, when when you're returning, like it, it really bridges people um, more effectively. And folks also can like, if they want to volunteer or give back, like it's just building that like, here's a here's a pathway and, uh, and again, built around like empowerment. Um, and the other piece that we're, we're doing too, which is super exciting is we also, um, we partner with a tablet company that uh, streams different educational and video content in like thousands of facilities across the country. So the Phoenix um, is one of their partners. And so we have people streaming different on-demand content and it's all, um, again, a lot of it can be fitness or other things. Um, most of the folks who are Phoenix representatives who are in those videos have lived experience personally incarcerated as well or with the criminal legal system. So they're also kind of sharing their experience. Um, and that is another way folks can start to bridge into um, different like when they're again coming coming back out how they can they plug into phoenix or if phoenix is in their community we try to make it really easy like katie kind of mentioned through our app and if you want to become a volunteer like it, it's pretty we're trying to shorten the timeline to get to do that so people can just be able to plug in so i don't know if that answered your question lisa but that's, totally, that's a little it bit it totally does and i bit, yeah. I'll, I'll share your shout out to middlesex county right not surprising they're one of the first to offer medications we work with them as well to provide medications for opioid use disorder and you know it just makes sense right if you're you know really interested in evidence-based and innovation that really supports recovery um then you're going to do both things right and i think that um, that's super exciting. And, you know, we're familiar, we, we, we do work in the community corrections office, like in Lowell. So, you know, I love when there's this like opportunity for overlap that we just, I, I didn't even know existed and it happens all the time. Um, Lisa, on this podcast. I just need to give a shout out to Middlesex, uh, sheriff's office as well. That's actually, I've shared on the podcast. Uh, they were nice enough to give me a place to stay for 16 months. And that's how I found spectrum health systems as a patient many moons ago uh, through a case manager there that who knows, maybe we'll be on the podcast uh, in coming months. But um, certainly, you know, I, I'm hearing all these different ways to connect people, that people aren't forgotten just because they're incarcerated or people aren't alone just because they're in active addiction. And, you know, they think that, oh, I only have, I only have a couple days, right? No, you, you have a couple days and then you can go and get plugged in you can download the app i'm going to download the app when we get out of here because i didn't know there was an app so uh that is that is really awesome and i i share in lisa's sentiment that you know it's great when i i found out about resources that are you, you know already in a community that i'm aware of and then we can add on i was just talking about the phoenix yesterday in a group with patients uh and now i'm able to you know give them some more concrete info next week in group about what exactly the phoenix is and hopefully they'll listen to this podcast. So good stuff. And I love what you said about that's inherent in the mission of the Phoenix, that everyone has intrinsic strengths and gifts. Like that really struck me. And we hear that over and over in the work that we do in connections with individuals working towards or in recovery. Um, and, you know, I just, this kind of puts that into action and really helps you know, build recovery capital. So I just got the slides from a training that you all were involved in with um, BMC's Gregan Center, and we've had um, the Gregan Center on the podcast as well. And I just, I think that um, efforts like this, connections and communities and activities like this really do support recovery capital. And so for those who don't really understand recovery capital, I'm going to give the definition that was given in that presentation. So credit and shout out, I think, to um, Danielle from BSAS, but, um, you know, critical elements that support that an, you know, that an individual possesses or that exist within his or her immediate surroundings that function to support and sustain a recovery ex experience. And so the Phoenix creates that immediate surrounding, right? It creates that environment of recovery, that environment of support, of connection, of 
things that really not just help somebody get into recovery, right? Post the 48 hours or however many days or minutes or months somebody has, but helps them stay there. Um, and can you talk a little bit about what that looks like? Like, how, you know, how, how would you say the Phoenix supports folks kind of staying in recovery? Yeah, I actually, when you're talking about recovery capital, I'm like, we measure that. <laughs> That's something we look at. We look at, you know, how people are gaining, gaining resources. And so earlier I was talking about connectedness and that's part of chime, which um, is connectedness, hope, identity, meaning, and empowerment. And we see that as people increase in chime, it really sets the foundation for them to um, gain additional recovery capital. Cause once you um, are starting to be more comfortable with who you are, then you're open to the resources. And so when we look at, at some changes and what people are gaining over time, um, we actually have seen, we our, our members report 10 times greater increases in recovery capital than that from other recovery community organizations, um, but similar increases in recovery capital than treatment pro to treatment programs. And we have some people are in treatment and find us once they get out of treatment or during their programs, like you mentioned, you're sharing with your clients about the Phoenix. Other people never go to formal treatment, yet they do find their way to the Phoenix. And so we see that um, it could be through connections with other members, through the volunteers, through the events that we offer at the Phoenix. We do a lot of um, you know, partnering with community organizations to share resources that are available within and around the community. Um, and this is something we're also exploring in the um, social network connections study that we're doing to see how people are gaining resources from that. Um, Sydney may have some stories to add in, but that's kind of from the, the research data perspective side of things. Uh, thanks, Kate. Before we move on to Sydney for the data, though, I just want to give a shout out to the research, right? Because I think we need it. Yeah. And I'm sure that the Phoenix knows that, which is why you are here in part of the Phoenix, right? And I think and I think that the field needs it. I think that the world needs it, right? So we need to look at evidence-based recovery, you know, and of course at Spectrum, we do a lot of evidence-based treatment, right? Inpatient treatment, medications for opioid use disorder, and fall, you know, but we also need, we also do a lot of peer work and a lot of other things. And we had Dr. Corey Vilsaint on um, not that long ago on the podcast within this past year, talking about the research being done on peer recovery support centers and how that increases, um, you know, recovery and get somebody closer to somebody without a substance use disorder, right? How much faster that happens when you have that. And it's exactly the kind of research you're talking about, Katie. So um, I just wanted to give a shout out to the research, but we also want to talk about the people. So Cindy, can you share a little bit about what this looks like? Yeah, well, and and just on like to piggyback Lisa a little bit, I I I totally agree, and I think that the research also helps us like drive innovation and shared learning, right? And so, um, that's what I feel again like just super grateful to be part of Phoenix that has like since day one we've really we're we're lucky to have been co-founded by someone who had a, a her doctorate in clinical social work, and so was like, hey, like even though this is novel and new and we don't see anything that's like kind of like this out there we really want to measure and evaluate what we're seeing as much as we can because that's going to drive our learning and let us not only further iterate our model but have, be able to like share knowledge and learn from others too and kind of have that like knowledge sharing ecosystem that drives innovation and change so um yeah i just i i can't overstate that enough i think it's so important um i think as far as Sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Um, the the stories behind, oh, like how we see kind of recovery capital change, I think. Um, I mean, you see it like, I can't tell you the amount of times that someone, we've seen someone kind of come into Phoenix programs and they might not know anyone or they might be a little more reserved or like kind of head down and like not as like engaging with folks, but they're like there to participate. And like, you know, it's a scary, we always, we sometimes say like the Phoenix, the, it's like the, uh, 
five thousand pound door, right? Like that's the hardest thing. Like anything else you're gonna do, the hardest thing is to go into a space, especially if you're new to recovery or you've, you know, that isn't the norm. Um, it can be really scary and intimidating. Um, but we'll see folks who kind of come in like they're kind of on their own doing their own thing. And I think one of my favorite, like it's a really little but big thing is um when people we do a lot of open gym programming in addition to like our classes um and a lot of I think some of the folks who come into open gym can be a little more like doing their own thing reserved on their own like um, and I love to see sometimes the transition of that where someone will maybe still do that thing but they're because the way they're you know getting exposed to oh we have this other program or maybe I'll do the CrossFit class or oh there's climbing or this thing I can do with a group of people to see people start to then like that was their way you know that was safe to kind of go in on their own and then start to see and get exposed to, oh, this, like, I could dip my toe here. Um, and then folks are like participating and like, I don't know, that to me is like, I've just seen it a few times over the years and it's really great. Um, but that to me is like kind of an example of buying of folks are increasing, you know, their self-esteem or wanting to engage with others or their like idea around recovery and sobriety might be shifting. So now they're wanting to, you know, come in and be a part of that group. And that's, bolstering their connection so that's great Sydney we know the opposite of addiction is connection and to see somebody you know maybe like you said dip their toe in and then you know show up and say hey this isn't this isn't that scary actually I'm I'm interested in <laughs> this right um I'm wondering e either one of you please I I'd love your your insight on this where where do you see the phoenix going as far as any exciting events coming up like nationally or things you could point us and our listeners to 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 be on the lookout for regarding all the great work that you do and and just really helping people get connected is there any like I, I don't even want to give examples, but <laughs> I, I'd, I'd love to just hear from either one of you about, you know, things that you're personally excited about with the Phoenix coming up and uh, maybe things you've done that, um, you know, really stand out to you that like, wow, that was, that was a really beautiful, engaging time. Yeah. Um, I would say for me, I think some of the work where like, so if the Phoenix, we've started developing our app over the last like two and a half or three years um, it was always kind of in the plans uh, to go figure out how we can digitally become more accessible to our community and help grow and empower folks. Um, but obviously COVID, like so many other things, kind of like brought that strategy to the front. Um, so we've really been working over the past few years um, on it. And I think one of the most exciting things is the app is a way where people can learn about in-person programs and access digital stuff programs as well. But it's also like it has expanded how people like connect to Phoenix. So there's different groups and affinity groups on there. So if you're like, I love pickleball and I'm also on this app and I want to meet other people who are interested in that, you can join that like affinity group and you can meet people from all across the country who are interested in that. You can learn from them. You can say, hey, I'm thinking about hosting this. How can I do that? And then you can actually connect with people in this like team up feature on our app that allows you to like share knowledge and build that kind of different layers of community. Um, I think the other piece of our, like our digital robot that we've started piloting this year that will only grow. And I think could, it, it builds on some of the, the strengths of like this whole ecosystem of the, uh, substance use recovery and treatment community is we have, um, a thing called partner spaces on the app right now, which I think it's about over 25 other organizations, um, a lot of them nonprofits, and it ranges from like CCAR uh, for peer recovery coaching. There's an organization called Seek Healing on there. Um, there's an organization called Ben's Friends that specifically does peer recovery groups for folks in the hospitality industry where uh, substance use rates are are particularly high. And so we kind of have all these partner organizations that if someone comes to Phoenix, they can then access any of those because maybe that's like additional level of support or care that Phoenix doesn't offer, but we can at least be the bridge and vice versa. Uh, so folks that maybe don't have a, they have a certain amount of reach, but know there is a higher need. Now they're actually, uh, or, or they're connected to one of the partner organizations and then they want to, you know, build, do other Phoenix things or help like get connected to a bigger recovery community. It kind of goes both ways. So to me that, and like, we're, I tell everyone, like we're open to partners we're trying to grow it we're in this pilot phase where we're really learning 
Um, but well, but to me, like the more it's kind of happened organically over the years where folks, we have partners that we work with or folks, you know, like I know, obviously knowing Lisa at Spectrum can be able to say like, Hey, like if, you know, there's something we can't provide, like this could be another, but it really kind of more formalizes and makes it easier for folks to decide what path is going to be best for them, um, at the end of the day and gives people the agency to access that whenever they want. So I think that's to me like up and it's, it's happening now, but I know it's going to grow. So it's really exciting for me. Um, to see. So this this podcast always brings about kind of future directions. You know, we're running Magnolia Family Groups based on this podcast. I was we're just thinking of that. Things, and so I'd love to have a follow up conversation, Sydney, about how we can partner together. We're about to open our fifth peer recovery support center in Southbridge. Um, and so, of course, we have our treatment continuum, and the, like to do, are really focused on breaking down stigma of treatment and particularly medication. But we also have a very strong. Um, peer recovery division. So I think there's just great opportunity potentially for us to become one of those um, partners in, in yeah. the field. Um, one of my favorite things about this podcast, right, is the connections that we get. Um, one of the things, the clinician in me, right, because I can't take the clinician out of me. Um, as I heard you talk earlier, Sydney, about the change that you see in individuals right and that they might start to you know show up just a little bit and just join open gym and then maybe try a class or you know that they're they really are you know changing their views about you know addiction recovery what that looks like in a sober life but they're really also changing the ideas about themselves mm -hmm. right and so like the cognitive behavioral therapist in me is like really drawing connections to how this kind of environment and connection and support to others really does help people change their beliefs about the world and others, right? So start to build some trust so you can show up to the gym for a little bit and you're like, all right, these people aren't so bad. They're like, they actually might like welcome me in and teach me how to do CrossFit or whatever, which that can be intimidating. I've done it, right? But, um, you know, but then they can change the beliefs about themselves and really start to challenge some of those core beliefs that have really been connected to their addiction in the first place, right? Which is really sustains recovery over the long term. Yeah, another event that um, we've actually done some research after with people who've, who've gone to it and dig into exactly what you're talking about is a retreat that we do in Moab every year. And, um, you know, it's it's pretty primitive camping. Um, we get together in a big tent city and we're out there for um, not quite four days. Um, people are hiking and rappelling and they are rock climbing and doing all kinds of things that maybe they've never tried before. Um, and then at some point during the day, we're coming together as a community. Um, the last night we have a gratitude circle where a lot of times people share their stories, um, which could have happened before they came, but a lot of times we hear about transformations that have happened from being part of this kind of more intensive experience. And people have talked about how they've um, maybe accomplished something. Like one woman came and she just wanted to take pictures of people who were rock climbing and thought that's something, that's never something that I could do. And, you know, she was taking all kinds of pictures and they said, well, you should try it. You should try it. And she's like, I don't know. And anyway, they convinced her to try rock climbing. And the next thing she knew, she was at the top of the climb and looking around and thinking, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I just did this. And the empowerment that she felt continued on past that point, right? That was just kind of the beginning. Um, and we have some other events that are, you know, multi-day events. Um, some of them have been associated with like uh, concerts and festivals where you have a lot of bands come in and we have sober spaces there and all kinds of activities that are happening. We just had, um, I think it was the second annual, you correct me if I'm wrong, Sydney, Soberfest up in Milwaukee where the mayor came and gave a proclamation and just brought the whole community together in a park in a space where um, it, it's usually not a positive setting and it, and it made it awesome with music and people gathering in the community. And so we do see people sharing those stories of kind of that mindset transformation where it's like, 
I can do this. I believe in myself. And I know that I have a community behind me to support me as I move forward. And the social events really changes. And Jesse, I'd love your thoughts on this too. Uh, what you believed you could do in recovery. Like you think about concerts, like I've talked to so many people who were like, yeah, well, not gonna do that. That's a high risk situation for me. I don't think I can do that sober, right? To like being in an immersive experience where yes, you can do that, right? You yes, you can, can enjoy yourself. <laughs> and and that is awesome. I look forward to uh, looking at, I have so many notes that I wanna dig into when we get <laughs> off here about different things that you're opening me up to. So thank you very much, Katie and Sydney for, all that you do. Uh, yeah, locally here, just this past Labor Day weekend, uh, shout out Sober in the Sun, uh, drug and alcohol free music festival, personally, very important in my early recovery, getting connected. You talked about recovery capital and just, you know, being around hundreds of people or thousands of people that are all there for recovery. It's it's powerful and it, it's still powerful. You know, I, I went for the day with my daughter and it was just such an amazing experience. Um, and yeah, we, we talk about things that maybe a casual listener to this podcast or kicking around the recovery thing maybe thinks like, like Lisa, you said, like, no way, I'm not going to do that. But the reality is we can do anything that we do under the influence in recovery, provided that we have that support and foundation. So whether it's sporting events or concerts or, you know, you name it, camping in the woods, fishing, I know all these things, like I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, the way I used to approach those events and, and now it looks very different. Um, so I, I would love to hear about any, uh, are there any coming up nationally that, you know, maybe our listeners, if they're in that, you know, cause this podcast goes all over the place. Um, maybe that they can look into if they're interested as far as uh, sober events. Yes, I think, um, well, we always have, so I'll, I'll pitch our app one more time. It's always a great, re you can basically put your zip code in and it'll pull anything in the 50 mile radius, whether it's a special event, like, Hey, we're at a music festival this weekend, or there's a walk going on, you know, a few minutes from your house. Um, I believe, yes, it's in New York. I'm looking this up right now on my other screen. Um, the Borderland Festival is in New York, um, that the Phoenix will have a, a sober space, um, in and that's coming up uh, September 13th and 15th um I really hope I'm right about this but I'm pretty I'm like 95 percent sure um and and yeah what it looks like is kind of similar to what Katie said like we we pick a few different um uh spaces and some of it's like depending on like the partnership some festivals are super like it's it's cool to see that shift and I'm sure you all have like seen this and that like culture shift too of like when you go to a uh like if you're in the store there's a there's like a alcohol section like there's also the non-alcoholic section and so to me that is like such an indicator of like this shift and so as a result we're also seeing that at like festival because they're realizing like hey like we can evolve and change and like having safe sober spaces for people that are alcohol free um is actually really beneficial to bringing more people in and having this be a more inclusive and accessible space so um we have like a little uh pop-up or area where people can come and hang be with other people who are in recovery um we'll have like non-alcoholic beverages that folks can can have they can also they are welcome to like we've had some folks who come like i've we we go down to jazz fest uh the past couple of years and we'll have some people who come up who either say um, kind of similar to what Jesse, you were saying before, like, I didn't think I could go to concerts anymore. Uh, and I'm so glad you're here because this is making, is changing actually what I think the, you know, the outlook of me going to engaging in music, yeah. because historically this has not been a place where I could go and stay sober and remain. And then we also have people who might not necessarily identify as in recovery, but it started, but they're really interested and they're like, Hey, this is, I actually hadn't thought about like, I didn't really want to drink, but like, that was all that was accessible. And I didn't really see any other spaces, but this feel, this is awesome. So I think it's just kind of opening that door to be like, wherever, wherever you're at, whatever your journey is at, you can, um, but yeah, so long answer to Borderland Festival is coming up, um, as a, as a music event. Um, and then we do that camping trip, I think comes up in the spring every year, uh, but the app will kind of have like everything that's the most up to date and stuff like that. But we're really excited to continue to do that, that kind of 
Um, awesome. I awesome. love that thought too, that, you know, it certainly doesn't even have to be someone who has a history of addiction, right? You could be part of that like larger sober curious movement, right? Of like, how can I exist in this world without substances differently or with less substances or whatever that might be. Um, and that's part of that, like seeing more non-alcoholic drinks. And that's also kind of preventative, right? If we create those environments and we change the perception that, you don't have to be wasted at this event in order to enjoy it. In fact, you'd probably enjoy it more. Um, you know, it really kind of can probably create some prevention for some folks down the line. Um, so that's also super cool. Yeah, a hundred percent. And like for me personally, like I grew up in a family that was both my parents struggled with addiction are now in recovery. Awesome. I personally like wasn't and I was exposed to their recovery which started to also shape like how I viewed my so while I didn't have to necessarily while I was like pre could have been definitely predisposed and like had my own different recovery paths to go through like I was exposed to Phoenix and I had these models of what sobriety could look like so it actually changed and I you know was like okay I don't need substances in my life because I can get off the train at any point um and so I think having that uh folks who were in my life and doing some of the coolest things and living, you know, not just staying sober, but really thriving was, was huge. So yeah, to your point, exactly. So people can get off at any point and it's great to see. They sure can. And, and I too can't shut up the clinician in me, even <laughs> though I, I look at this from multiple levels. So I'm, I'm wondering, Katie, if anyone's interested in all this research that we talk about and all these, you know, you talk about a 10% increase in chime and increase in recovery capital. Is there anywhere that people could go to, to look at this research or if they want to learn more information about why we do research on this or how? Is there anywhere that you would say would be a good good place to start? Definitely. So we've been working on adding some of our own internal resources with Phoenix data to our webpage. It's just the phoenix.org slash r dash research. And um, we're partnering with other people besides uh, Meg Patterson at Texas A&M. We're part partnering with people at the Recovery Research Institute at Harvard, as well as David Bust over in the UK um, nice. and others. And so um, we have our collaborators listed, and then at the bottom of the page, we have um, some reports that we've done. And we also are looking for people who are interested in collaborating on research with us. Maybe there are other nonprofits, maybe there are other researchers that are listening to this, this podcast, and they're like, wow, the Phoenix has a pretty big membership. Maybe that's, you know, because we've reached over 500,000 people. And so, you know, maybe we'll want to partner. And so, um, research and evaluation at the phoenix.org um, is the email address that they could reach out to. Um, there's also like the Recovery Research Institute has a website where they have a lot of resources um, posted online. Um, and then there's a lot of um, other organizations where they are focusing on recovery, where they're starting to post more and more resources. So like I could go on, but those are a few places uh, to get started. Awesome, thank you. Also, so more opportunities potentially for partnership going forward just with Spectrum and Women Recovery Center's reach across uh, Massachusetts. And yeah. we are in Virginia too in correctional environment and it sounds like you're comfortable in that space too, so. <laughs> So much to come out from this. Yeah. I'll have to do another <laughs> episode. Like, and here's all the things that started to go. Right, we can do a follow up. Here's the yeah. cool things that we did after this. Yeah. Episode. You know, we've done that. We've done that um, before as well. So I mentioned that we started running Mag Magnolia family support groups on Wednesday nights. Still run them. If folks are interested, just email magnolia at spectrumhealthsystems.org. Um, after we had Maureen Kavanaugh on the podcast, and we she trained all of our team multiple times, actually three different. Yep. Times. And um, then we had her back on to talk about like, okay, what now what? Like, how's that going? What else, what else should we be doing? And um, this, this to me sounds like a great opportunity to build some partnerships and connection um, and then talk about it again here. Totally. totally. Certainly. All right. Well, this has been, um, you know, again, one of my favorite times of 
um, of the year, um, having these conversations in Recovery Month. And this episode did not disappoint. It's um, all I thought it would be. I really appreciate you giving your time. That volunteerism is so important to the Phoenix, but I also get it's your time and you have lots of other cool things you could be doing. And so we just really appreciate you coming on and talking to us. Um, anything that you, you didn't say that you wanted to or to be covered? Um, I just want to like thank you all for for having creating this platform to uplift other other folks in this space. And, and like you just said, like I think it it yields a lot of different collaborations. Um, so I was listening to some of the episodes in, in leading up to this, and it was just kind of cool to see like the breadth of different folks and, and perspectives that you've shared. So, um, so thank you for what you all do every day and, and what you're elevating on this platform. And, um, yeah, we're we're excited to, to do more. And I think this is, this is an example of like uplifting, hopeful, uh, you know how how this how we're going to kind of come together and and hope and and people's strengths to to change this issue so thank you katie would you add anything (laughs) well i would echo what you said um and just you know thank you for the opportunity to come on and have a conversation with you to share about what we're doing but the the broader implications of things you know recovery is something that you sh- should not have to do alone and helping people who are in recovery is something that we don't want to do alone we really appreciate um, the partnerships and collaborations and we're open to more at the phoenix Awesome. Expect some well, emails. Expect some emails. Yep. All right. Well, thanks so much. Um, this is our first episode of Recovery Month. Stay tuned. We've got an episode on housing next week on purpose. Um, the week after that with our own Kathy Wise. And we have another kind of peer support approach, um, our Lynn Community um, you know, Peer Recovery Center on uh, to talk about community in the last week. So um, stay tuned and keep listening. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Mom.